remember hitting a rock and felt my arm break. Uh, the next thing I knew I was at the bottom of the hill, half buried. Within seconds I was cartwheeling down the slope. I remember bashing my head uh, quite hard and I, I screamed out, oh no, I'm going to die. Everybody ready? People climb mountains because they are there. And whenever people climb mountains, sooner or later, other people have to rescue them. This winter, Inside Story had unprecedented access to the organizations that make up the Scottish Mountain Rescue. 25 civilian teams, two teams from the RAF, and helicopters from both the Navy and the Air Force. This is their story. Freedom, in it. Nobody to tell you what to do. No wash, not there, no weaving, no washing. <laughs> <laughs> there's nobody there, is there? I mean, we don't want to talk to anybody. You don't have to talk to anybody. There's no popes, there's nothing. There's no fumes. It's just pure, in it? You know, it's only natural that the public are going to be um, concerned about all these accidents, but I mean, it's a very popular activity. The attraction is. I suppose uh, <laughs> pitting yourself against the snow, trying not to fall off, um, it's just good fun. Initially I was a sort of bikini woman, you know, wouldn't do anything unless it was topical. But I don't know, there's a lot more satisfaction in this, I think, isn't there? The worst could happen and hopefully the rescue services are there to help you out. But uh, can't assume or rely on anything. The Air Force fly every day anyway. It's irrelevant whether he flies over here to rescue somebody or whether he flies four hours in the sticks just to get his hours in, so he's flying anyway. I fly a helicopter worth many millions of pounds with three other human lives on it. They are not there solely for mountain rescues. Every rescue is different. There are the ones that are the genuine accidents. They're always going to happen. There are ones where had they taken uh, what we'd call common sense precautions so we can actually get to them in plenty of time. We see those basic precautions time and again not taken. On any weekend of the year as many as 50,000 people will be out on the hills and mountains of Scotland. Climbing is Britain's fastest growing sport. Right, casualties on the door is 50 yards. On this occasion, the precise location of an accident is known. A number of climbers have been caught in an avalanche. Mountain rescues involve the whole community. With a helicopter on its way, a ground-based team is preparing to take up extra equipment. They are borrowing the ski resort snowcat. This winter, 64 people have already been caught in Scottish avalanches and 10 of them have died. Find them up on our way so you get the people on. On the mountain, the weather is not as good as they had hoped. Steve, we're just going to take, uh, take charge of this radio, basically. In these conditions, even the snow cat cannot get any further. The rescuers will have to go the last mile on foot. Uh, King Gun Control from King Gun Con. We'll leave the snow cat here as instructed. To get in contact with him, you'll need to do it via the chairlift company. Over. Okay, let's just keep it fairly tight then. We'll just go in another way. Okay, I think dead ahead looks reasonable. Landing a helicopter in a whiteout blizzard is not an easy operation. Three descending. 
Two and left. One and left. They have managed to get the helicopter very close to the scene and have arrived to meet the ground-based team. Five climbers have been injured. RAF man Mick Lambert tries to assess the medical priorities. There's a limit as to how many casualties the helicopter can hold. I have a, a voice-activated radio, which I've got constant communications with the aircraft captain. Um, I went directly to the on-scene commander, who happened to be wearing a day-glow vest, to find out exactly how many casualties we have. In those conditions, you actually deal with facts that actually come in and actually deal with what you see on site. It's only afterwards you have time to actually think about the dangers. We were in the snow for two hours, I think, in total. And long before the helicopter arrived, I'd sort of given up fighting for myself and, and I let the rescuers do that job for me. Uh, there were a lot of people around helping. I mean, they covered me with uh, jackets and bivy bags and so on to keep me warm. And I was just sort of lying back. Uh, when the helicopter came in, I, <laughs> I was fairly unaware of it. Really. We're actually starting to go for 45 minutes. These casualties, some of them, were buried quite deep into the snow. And uh, with compounded with their injuries, it took quite a long time for the mountain rescue team, who was on scene, plus the rear crew for my aircraft to actually get in there, get the casualties out and get them into stretchers. Philip Birch was the first of the casualties to be stretchered away. He had a broken leg and fractured wrist. Visibility is now so bad that if it weren't for the noise of the engine, the team might not have even found the helicopter. Time is of the essence. Evening is approaching and the temperature is falling fast. Visibility is getting even worse and the snow getting deeper. At that point I didn't realise my leg was broken. It was under about a foot and a half of snow. And I think most people think of snow as being very soft and fluffy. Uh, this was like wet concrete on top of your legs. It's not something you can just brush aside with your hand. So they have to dig me out, which took about 20 minutes maybe half an hour to dig out my legs. And at that point, they realised that my leg was broken as well, possibly my ankle. The cold was terrible. I was just so relieved. I just, it was like a dream. I just was lying there in the stretcher thinking, is this, is this, has this happened to me? You know, it was, it was so quick. It was, it was like I was looking down at myself thinking, you know, I can't be here. I can't have broken legs and broken arms and an avalanche. This was just a day out in the hills. Rescue 137 to all stations. All five casualties are aboard Rescue 137 in Bounty Rate War Hospital. That's all five casualties away in a helicopter. Uh, we had one casualty initially, and then a further four late, were reported later on avalanche from Goat Track Gully. Uh, all five casualties just been helicoptered off. Well, I think the first one went earlier. He went There's, on his own. Yeah, I think right. there seems to have been five, next to Six three, casualties. Next one, yeah. Yeah. Um, but our guys have obviously got them into the helicopter and uh, they're away. Once off the mountain, there's still a 30-mile journey to the nearest hospital in Inverness. The avalanche victims are now safe, but the rescue team still have to make their perilous way back down the avalanche-prone mountain on foot. 
at the time we were descending the gully, I could see it was avalanche prone, and I was very frightened. Uh, but I had to make a decision whether to retreat back up the slope and cr try and cross the Cairngorm Plateau in uh, gale force winds, which were so strong I could barely stand up, and in whiteout conditions where I could hardly see, or whether to continue down the gully and chance my luck. It wasn't until we had started descending that we realised it could have been a mistake, but that's not something we could have sort of foreseen at the time. There were many press reports and papers all, all around the country, and many of them were uh, described us as idiots and told us we, we were grossly stupid. Certainly the articles indicated that you know, we were just a bunch of idiots going out into the hills. We knew the conditions were going to be bad, and it went so far as to say that you know, people were still heading out into the hills as avalanches were falling all around them, which was complete nonsense. On the day itself, we, we'd heard nothing of the avalanche warnings that the press had told us that we'd ignored. Um, we'd not heard of the uh, coming avalanche conditions. Um, and we'd, we'd made our own decisions based on our own knowledge. This is BBC Radio Scotland, the UK national station of the year. In Inverness, five people are being treated in hospital after being caught in an avalanche in the Cairn Gorms. The search is underway in Glencoe for a missing hill walker who has been reported overdue. David Allison reports. Mountain rescue teams in Glencoe are being helped in their search for an overdue hill walker by a Navy helicopter from... In the Scottish hills and mountains, situations can change rapidly and unpredictably. A hill walker has gone missing in an area of some 100 square miles and nobody knows where he is. This is a mountain rescue nightmare. In fact, it's already the second day of the search and five rescue teams are involved, including one from RAF Kinloss. The civilian team will, will call us in if, it's, if they see it being a protracted search. Well, they want a lot of people to flood the area fairly quickly. They will go to the police. The police go to uh, our control centre, Petrivi, and then they will call us. So yes, we may come there half a day, a day later. These hills look deceptively simple and often attract inexperienced walkers. Around here, any hill more than 3,000 feet is known as a Munro, and some walkers try to climb or bag as many Munros as they can in a day. If you get lost out here, you're almost impossible to find, but the search goes on. Well, there's uh, a guy missing uh, since yesterday, uh, and it's a fairly big area he's gone into. He's, he was going to bag two Munros, and uh, there, there's loads of escape routes off, and there's loads of corridors he's got to fall in or walk into. So uh, it's a fairly big task. The uh, weather was absolutely hideous. High winds, blizzards, fairly big avalanche risk. But if there's a chance of getting somebody out alive, like the first initial days, where day one or two, where there's possibly a good possibility of them being alive, then um, we will go out in, in all conditions, as if we can still operate in those conditions, to try and, try and get them off the hill. There's about eight of us in my search party are trying to clear a, a fairly big glen, so it's fairly hard going. Progressively, the rescuers cover higher and higher ground. That took about three or four hours to clear as best we could in the, in the conditions. We then went up another small glen that came off that glen and um, down a fairly dangerous slope. And one of the guys who was clearing a ridge thought he swatted a body and we all went uh, pell-mell for that. But there was no body and the day ends with no sign of the climber who has now been missing for 48 hours. In deteriorating conditions, orange flares are used to guide in a helicopter and get the rescuers safely off the hills. The missing walker has now been named 
He's Alan Sands, a man in his 20s from Glasgow. Behind the blow to land on. Down three on the tail. Down two. One. Tail's coming on. One to me. They are widening the search and the helicopter is planning to take a team up to a remote part of the mountainside. The rescuers reach the higher ground, but even so the day's search ends in failure. It's not until the morning of the fourth day that Alan Sands is finally found. who'd been missing in Glen Coe since Friday has been found dead. Rescue teams had resumed their search this morning, concentrating on a specific area after word of a possible sighting. Mr Sands, who was 24, worked as a bookshop manager in Glasgow. Last night, the body of another climber, Martin Brainer from Worcestershire, was brought down off Ben Nevis. Mountain rescue teams are normally local men who are themselves dedicated climbers. The, the team itself is a club. I mean, we're all, we're all walkers and climbers. Uh, we get on well together, we've got a common interest. And in a sense, to some, some of the chaps in the team, uh, the mountain rescue side of it is just something that the club does. Two main things we're going to do at this location. One is we're going to practice the avalanche transceivers and uh, Willie Ross is going to take a group doing that. Eric's going to do avalanche probing. If you live in an area in the Highlands which is popular for mountaineers and, and can cause them problems then it would seem just the most humane thing to do is to have a rescue team that could go to their aid. I mean there's a chap who lives in my village and he often says, well, why should you go out and risk your life for someone who's lost or injured? And you explain to him, well, it's not really like that. I said, I was never in any danger. A week later, there's another rescue. It's not fair. Why should you go out and risk your life? You know, and I've told him, I said, it's not like that. But everybody likes a good story. With heroes, the rescuers, and villains, the foolhardy climbers. And wherever there's a good story, there's always the temptation to exaggerate. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In fact, uh, everything that's in it about the cost is, in my opinion, a myth. Uh, the cost of 9.3 million doesn't exist. In it, they said that they had a Nimrod aircraft set aside to um, take care of communica communications and mountain rescue. Uh, I had to laugh. I mean, I've personally carried our communications. It comes in a plastic tray and we put it in the back of the Land Rover. The police budget in the Northern Constabulary for last year was something like £50,000, which covered the eight mountain rescue teams in the Northern Constabulary area. That's £50,000 for the eight teams, and they possibly are doing 300 rescues, so that the actual cost is really quite negligible. My personal expenses last year were £20. That's what I claim back.
from the police for loss of petrol and things. So uh, where these figures come from, I don't know, but people should be made to answer for that. It's, it's bad journalism, and it's grossly misleading the public. Okay, sticking with the road now, which goes through this little village on the left-hand side. I told the controller as well, if it's a problem, we'll be working through Aberdeen. Okay. But mountain rescue teams do sometimes risk their lives. This will be one of those times. There's been a serious accident on Loch Nagar. Loch Nagar is an isolated mountain six miles south of Balmoral. It has challenging climbs much loved by experienced mountaineers. Now one of them, Roger Chippendale, has had a freak accident and fallen some 200 feet onto an inaccessible snow ledge. Roger is a well-known climber and a personal friend of many of the rescuers. The plan is that one team from Braemar should head for the summit plateau and try to reach the climber from there. At the same time, another team will walk into the quarry beneath in case the only way to get him out is to stretch him down the mountain. As we walked up towards the quarry, it looked very good. I mean, things were quite hopeful. Apart from the fact it was hard going because of the, the loose snow, it was moonlit. Uh, we were sheltered from the wind by the mountain itself. So I mean, I myself thought we'll probably have him off within two or three hours, which would have been would have been excellent. Uh, obviously, I didn't know at that point what the conditions were like on top. I suggest, Mick, probably if you want to go out and have a chat, I don't think we can help them up there at all. Do they want us to stay here? Given the weather and the inaccessibility of the fallen climber, they decide not to use the helicopter. Okay, I am now off. Am I clear out? Yes, you are. Off How many radios have we got issued? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Everybody got an avalanche transceiver? Yes. Need one. Need one. Need one. Need one. All we know is that a guy 200 feet from the top of Harwell B, fractured femur, fractured tib, tib, been there since 3 o'clock, it's now after 9. Technically, the police are in charge of mountain rescues. In this case, given the geography of the mountain, direct radio communication between the teams is increasingly difficult. So they have to use mobile phones to relay messages to each other via the local police station in the valley below. Already, the rescue is beginning to look more difficult than it first appeared. As soon as we started to gain more height, uh, the wind uh, increased with every step we took. Heavy, heavy snow showers uh, were coming down, which equated to blizzard conditions. When we did get up onto the first part of the plateau, uh, about 3,000 feet, uh, we were struck by um, gale force winds. We were hardly able to keep our feet. Um, it was obviously very dark, but coupled that with the blizzard, navigation was impossible. As soon as you tried to look into the, the snow, your, your eyes, your face became plastered in snow. You couldn't read a compass. Uh, even with goggles on, they become completely plastered with snow, and you just couldn't see to make headway, uh, and just no way we could function up in that sort of environment. Communications weren't that good by radio at the time. We actually had to call the, the police station to call back to Graham. So when we arrived in the quarry, we weren't aware at that point that they'd had to turn back. So uh, basically, we just bivvied down. We've got big nylon group shelters, so the group was just sat in those in an area we considered to be as safe as possible. What's actually happening at the moment then, do we think? What's the plan? Well, the party with the team leader are going up the shoulder on the right, across the top to the top of us. And they've got all the, the stretcher and the ropes, and hopefully they're going to set up a top rope, lower one of our men down to the casualty, and then they'll assess how he is and what we're going to do from there. I would think that they'll probably attach him to the rope 
I mean, we lower him down to us and we'll wait at the bottom and pick him up and stretch him out from there. What depending on how he is. His climbing partner has told us that he thinks that he's, that he's broken some bones in his lower leg. He may have also broken his femur in his upper leg, which is obviously a more serious injury. But uh, we'll just have to wait until one of the two members on top gets down to the, the casualty to assess, assess us his condition. How long has he now been on the mountain? Well, it's now nearly half eleven, twelve o'clock. Eight and a half hours. Yeah. Happened to three o'clock. Quite a while. Yeah. Once the set the dealer is up the top and get himself sorted out, uh, it'll probably be at least an hour before the casualty is actually moving. Uh, Although we're, we're finding it reasonably warm here, yeah, you know, you're, you're stuck further up with maybe not much clothing and so having sustained an injury as well. You know, it's probably uh, 20 people from the police team and ground team combined with those from the Bremar team. Uh, the Aberdeen team is set off as well, as we understand it. So. Bearing in mind that half of those are at the top already. <clears throat> so we're depending on the Aberdeen team coming into the quarry as well. And then maybe what? 20 of us then. Carry the stretcher out. Right. The mine and a half. As the weather gets worse and worse, the lower team are in danger from avalanches from above. They have no option but to retreat to the safety of a nearby snow cat. Roger Chippendale is an experienced climber and should know how best to survive these conditions but he's been trapped on his ledge for 12 hours now and he may have internal injuries. It's a bitterly frustrating time. Chippendale is a colleague and fellow climber. They are desperate to continue the search if it is at all possible. Right, hello. I'm afraid you'll have to show it. You're very faint. Right, can you just repeat your message? Over 100 knots on top of Cairngorm at present. But it doesn't look as if it will be possible to continue the search tonight. Have you any idea of what sort of time that you can expect them to drop? Uh -huh. So I'm shooting for afternoon. We're just above 700 metres at the moment and uh, it's been snowing heavily, uh, even heavy showers and then uh, three periods in between, it's extremely windy. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers, bye. Well, it seems little point in staying out here because it's basically going to be absolutely horrendous. He says we're not going to see any improvements until at least 11 o'clock on the day tomorrow. It's 115 knots on top of Cairngorm at the moment. He's uh, saying the snow that will start to die out you know, by morning. The decision is made to go back down the mountain. Probably uh, the hardest decision I've had to make out on the hills uh, because I knew that time was of the essence and if we were going to retreat off the mountain uh, we were going to lose an awful lot of time 
uh, and everything is telling you you must go on uh, but when you face reality you know that uh, the team members couldn't possibly have survived and I was going to put uh, a lot of men's lives uh, in very real danger. However tired they may be, turning back now inevitably feels like desertion. Winds of more than 100 miles an hour are preventing rescuers from reaching an injured climber who spent all night on a cliff ledge 200 feet below the summit of Loch Nagar. Eric Crockart reports. Roger Chippendale from Aviemore is thought to have suffered multiple leg injuries after falling yesterday from the parallel B buttress in Loch Nagar. A rescue helicopter is standing by in the nearby village of Ballater, but no one knows what condition the injured climber is in after a night in the mountain. In the morning, a somewhat desperate attempt to remount the rescue has been beaten back by the weather. My, my thinking is that uh, there's nothing, at present there's nothing we can do, it's just a case of being available. I don't see that being the case. Um, but the, the weather in terms of flying around the countryside is uh, uh, yeah, too from velocity. I don't see that being a problem. Uh, well, my thinking, I'll need to confirm it, please, but my thinking is the time it's going to take for the MRT, assuming it can get to where the guy is, by the time they get him up the hill, it's probably about the transit time of velocity. Yeah. But by midday, there has been some improvement. Eager to regain lost time, they decide to use the helicopter to try and get some of the rescuers higher up the mountain. Yes, it is. climbing partner had described to us how they had spoken to each other um, and how Roger had said he was going to dig himself into the snow uh, for protection. Uh, we knew he was experienced and we felt that, yeah there was a, a chance because the snow basin he'd fallen into uh, had a good accumulation of snow and had he been able to dig in he would have had some shelter so we were very uh, optimistic that he, he was still alive. For the first time since the operation began the rescuers are in sight of their goal. After I'd watched the weather for two, three hours, I realized that the wind was easing very slightly and decided to go again. When we got to the lip of the first summit, uh, the wind accelerated over the lip of the mountain that was coming across the plateau at speeds in excess of 130 miles per hour, uh, blowing snow at the same time and uh, it's, it's ferocious. I'd said to the men that if we could get to the top then we would start to set up the rescue. If we felt that we couldn't go on any longer we would just leave everything and come off uh, and that there was a fresh team coming right behind us and it wouldn't be lost. Despite the high winds, the helicopter manages to land some rescuers not too far from the summit. Everything is finally in place. One team is at the summit, 200 feet above the injured climber. The other team is below, waiting to receive him. There are now 68 people involved in the rescue attempt. You've got a, a mile of cliff uh, and a big semicircle. And from above, it all looks exactly the same. There's no distinguishing features. Uh, we've got huge cornices that build up of snow at the top of the, the cliff, overhanging. Uh, so we've got one team member out in the end of a rope, and he's basically trying to peer over the edge of this cornice, which could collapse with him at any time. Um, the danger of his life, you've also the danger of the casualty underneath, because if you send a cornice down on top of him, then you're, you're reducing his chances. Uh, so it's very, very difficult trying to find the exact spot because when you lower a rope over the cliff edge, you've got no... You can't say, oh, I need to go three feet to the left or three feet to the right. It has to be exact in the right place. Uh, and that 
took us quite some time to actually locate the exact spot to put the, the rope over. Well, it's actually helped by us, I think, at the bottom because we had the binoculars <coughs> and we were in a position at that point to talk with the guy that was getting lowered over. Mm -hmm. And the first time we appeared was maybe 200 metres to the right of the climb that uh, Mr Chippendale was actually on. So, you know, with the cloud clear, we were able to direct him to move further around. But, I mean, each time he has to move back, the belay has to be moved, the whole team has to be moved across, so it takes a long time. Then he appeared maybe a, a hundred yards from it, and then the other side, and then, you know, eventually spot on above the climb. We can actually see Mr Chippendale through the binoculars, and, uh, of course, we were unsure whether he was alive or not. So, I mean, when you say you've seen him, everybody perks up. At that point, you're still hoping that he's managed to hold on. And uh, you can actually sense the eagerness of the teams that were there. At this critical moment, the weather has become marginally clearer. It's the team's first lucky break, but it may not last for long. It is now nearly 24 hours since Roger Chippendale fell but the teams cannot allow their eagerness to compromise the care with which they must prepare for the final stage. step was to get a man over the edge of the cliff on the end of a rope and lower him down to, to the casualty uh, and to find out the condition and, and what was necessary next. Uh, so the team member was lowered over the edge uh, on the 800 foot rope and he went down about 300 feet and uh, we were getting radio messages back up from him uh, and from above he was wondering if the casualty was alive, he wasn't seeing any response. We had a doctor, team doctor, standing by with the stretcher and he was just ready to go over the edge um, with the stretcher and, and the plan was to, to get Roger onto the, the stretcher and down to the team waiting below. That's quite a lot of rope we've paid out. And then when he did get alongside him, he eventually came back onto the, the radio and said that there was no signs of life. Uh, at that stage, I think, uh, the, the morale dropped again uh, and these fluctuation of, of um, moods is, is easy to see on, on a summit when everyone is so exhausted um, feeling sure very very quickly uh, and it was easy to see that, that everyone on the top um, was devastated to, to find that having put that effort in uh, that we were too late and you can't help feeling why couldn't we have got here earlier why didn't we get here last night uh, and these thoughts are going through everyone's minds. That particular night, uh, that 25, 26 hours, was probably the, the hardest um, time I've spent both weather-wise and decision-wise. I knew that the ultimate decision was mine to go back, to turn back the night before, uh, and, and you're feeling, was it the right decision? Could I have done something else? Uh, so it, it was a very, very difficult decision to make, but uh, I still feel it was the right decision to make at the time. It puts it in perspective, you think um, it could easily have been me. Um, we were climbing on the cliff face uh, the week before uh, on, on similar climbs and you, know, you look back on that and think, well, why did I get off with it? Why did I manage yeah. to succeed? But the job must be completed and the team return joyless carrying only the dead body of the man they had fought for 24 hours to save. It's 10 o'clock, Radio Scotland News with Graham Anderson. Two climbers who fell 200 feet on a mountain in the Lochaba area have been successfully rescued. The climbers who fell Last week's failure is followed by this week's success. And almost certainly, this success will be followed by further failures. For climbing is dangerous as well as popular. And as long as there are climbers, there'll be men and women 
ready and willing, if not always able, to rescue them. Next week, Inside Story follows Scotland Yard's art squad across the globe on the trail of priceless stolen paintings and antiques. That's next Thursday at 10 on BBC One.